Welcome in to the Ots and Audibles podcast. I'm a Primark Scopo, Jared Mack. On today's show, it's a modified week, the second one in three weeks for the Ducks because they play on Friday yet again. Uh, Friday night kick, 5 p.m. local Pacific time kickoff. Uh, Jared will be back there at West Lafayette to cover this game. Oregon at Purdue, game on Fox. Um, it's the next one. And I think that's where, like, we have to submit our storylines to Jared earlier this later this week. And mine's going to be about, like, how does this team kind of get past the biggest game ever at Austin Stadium? Um, it's a short week. The, the juice is certainly not going to be as high as it was against Purdue or as it was against Ohio State. But nonetheless, this is a game you should dominate. And it's it's going to be interesting. I, I think this game has taken another life for me just because of how emotional last week was. And you saw Purdue give Illinois a run for their money in overtime. Oregon should blow them out, but it's a game where we'll learn a lot about the culture of this team. Yeah, I think the culture part. I think we already have a really a pretty good idea. Yeah. I mean, if you watch that Ducks versus them thing last night, you got a sense of what was going on behind the scenes. Like this is a team that seems really connected, which is obviously like a, a you know main character trait of a Dan Landing coach team. But you're right. We'll, we'll see it tested now in terms of going from we just beat arguably the best roster in the country to we're facing a roster that's nowhere near as talented. And we'll get into it. I think there's some areas where Purdue could give Oregon some issues. Um, but at the end of the day, they're a four-score favorite for a reason. And we'll see if Oregon is adept and ready to go on the road. I mean, Jared and I talked about it in our Monday mailbag. This does have all the trap game fixings of a short week on the road, a couple time zones away, uh, a team that you're you know highly favored against that has no conference wins and one win all season and, and has been kind of dominated most weeks um, this year. So <laughs> It's going to be a test of the culture, like we said. I think it's going to be a, a game where we hopefully come out saying this team has figured out a way to play with some consistency and execute with some consistency. Um, we've seen them take a step or a couple steps in that direction, obviously, during the the last three or four games. But um, this feels like another opportunity to do that against a Purdue team, which has one win, maybe a little squirrely. We can get into some of the things, but uh, obviously you, you should come out of this week feeling like you should win pretty dominant. Yeah, hundred percent. I don't, I'm not too concerned with Oregon getting up for this game. Um, like Eric and I talked about on Monday, you know, this was kind of the same message or storyline that was delivered before Oregon took on Michigan state. You know, it was a short week. You could look ahead very easily to playing mm -hmm. Ohio state the next week. Um, it's very easy to just kind of let your guard down against a team that's a little frisky, um, had more more than just one win on the season like Purdue did, but could certainly kind of stack up points and play defense. Um, and Oregon came out and, you know, really dominated Michigan State. I know that they had the two red zone interceptions. I get that 100%. Didn't matter. That game wasn't close if you watched the same game that I did. So right. that's kind of how I expect this one to go with Purdue. Um I think it's, it's it's more than time that we can jump into Purdue. Um, they're they're an interesting team. Last week against uh, Illinois, obviously they had a brand new offensive coordinator, new offense or not a brand new offensive coordinator. It was the head coach who's a defensive guy now calling plays, which is an interesting perspective. But um, a lot of new wrinkles to the system. Illinois had that game like I think it was uh, thirty four to twenty with thirteen minutes left in the fourth quarter. Like they just yeah, absolutely weird game. blew that game. Very strange yeah. game, uh, onside kick recover, like some fumbles, some interceptions, some just horrendous tackling from both sides of the ball. So Oregon now has at least a game to watch from Ryan Brown, their retro freshman expected starting quarterback now that Hudson Card is injured. For Hudson Card, former high school quarterback of Will Stein down yeah. there in Texas. So some connection there as well, but um, a lot of RPOs, a lot of, like design kind of rollouts in this new quote unquote new Purdue offense. Um, Brown is a, a solid quarterback. I think I don't really think that Illinois defense is that good, but um, this is going to be his second career start going against an Oregon defense. That is one of the better defenses in the nation. Um, I know that the stats won't prove it, but the talent that is on the ducks front seven is really damn good. And it's with uh, an offensive line that has certainly some question marks. So 
I, I think it could be interesting for the first quarter of the game, but this is an Oregon team that is much too talented to allow for Purdue to kind of come back like they did against Illinois or allow them to jump in the game uh, for, for all of the game. First quarter, sure, it's the first quarter. But after that, uh, I think it should turn into an Oregon blowout. This feels a lot like a play-with-your-food type game where we could see some funky trick plays the first half just to put them out there on tape for the Illinois, the the Michigan, the Wisconsin, the Washington teams to, like, see and then, oh, okay, now we have to prepare, prepare for this. And then in the second half, like Jared said, I think it's going to be a lot like what happened against UCLA where they're so bad against the run that mm-hmm. – Oregon might just shrink the game real fast and just get out of West Lafayette with a, you know, they could have put up two or three more extra touchdowns. Maybe they only do one and a field goal because they just want to get out of there quick, get out of there healthy, which by the way, we haven't talked about. Um, yeah, let's do that real quick. What's you guys were at practice. I've been, obviously you can tell by my voice. I've been out sick. Uh, what's, what's the injury report from, the, the Tuesday practice and what kind of feedback did Dan give on any kind of pen, punishment for Treshawn Holden and the, uh, the spit that we had, which is mind boggling to say. Yeah. Well, I mean, for on the Holden front, obviously Dan wasn't pleased at all and gave a pretty firm rebuke to that sort of thing as any head coach. I can't imagine there's a head coach in the country that would sign off on a player spitting on somebody. And frankly, I, I think it was, a, a good thing that Dan was was pretty firm in that. Um, in terms of what we know with uh, additional disciplinary action, that's it sounds like being kind of kept internal. So mm-hmm. I, I think it's on the table that Treshawn is suspended in some capacity. I think it's also possible he starts and plays the whole game in West Lafayette. I don't think we have clear feel for that. We can say he was at Tuesday's open practice, looked like he did everything. Jared, even correct me if I'm wrong, if he was – being held out. I can't imagine he would be. Um, so no, he was, he was good. Yep. He was good. Uh, Jordan Birch is obviously the the other player. Oregon fans will want an update from, and uh, he, I don't think will play this week was not at Tuesday's practice. Dan really kept the window or the door open in terms of a return and even kind of kept it open for this week, which I think was more gamesmanship than probably anything else. But um, you know, I think there was obviously a concern. This was a season ending or something that would, you know, at least force him out until, you know, into December. I don't know if that'll be the case or not, but uh, Dan certainly made it clear that this is not believed to be a season ending. And the reason I feel strongly that it's not is because he was later asked about Kyler Casper. Um, and I know Jared has the exact quotes because he he uh, transcribed it and wrote the story, but uh, he was a little more forthcoming with the fact that this could be something quite serious for Kyler and maybe something that, you know, forces him to miss the rest of the year. Yeah, Dan basically said uh, he won't put a timetable on it because he doesn't want to limit Kyler's restrictions or, like, give him a restriction. Um, I think that's more just coach speak for, like, yeah, he's probably done for the year. Um, Just isn't very committal. Dan isn't very committal to, like, any of the injury questions, so it all kind of makes sense. But this is about as much as, like, all right, that guy is probably gone for most of the year, if not all of the year, um, the way he answered that question. So we saw Kyler – Last week in practice with a boot on his right leg, right foot, um, lower leg. And that remained the same uh, during the, the Ohio State game. I don't think we saw him after practice on Tuesday, if I remember correctly. I I, I, did. Actually, I, I did see him, and he was in a boot with the scooter again. Yeah, so not great. Not exactly what you want for, especially in this game where, you know, Trishon Holden, we don't know what the repercussions are of his actions. He could be out. The whole game, he could be out a quarter. Like, who knows what's a, what the, what's going to happen there? But that means to, that Justice Lowe is going to have to step up, and it'd be nice to have a Kyler Casper in this case. Um, but he won't be playing, so it'll have yeah. to be it'll have to be Justice Lowe, and then potentially somebody else down the line. I wonder if Gary Bryant's going to be available at all. I, I will I say so. I don't think he will. I will say I think we're getting closer because he returned a punt which is something we hadn't seen him do since august we're we're in this now we've seen him return a punt it's just we're in the same spot as we were like when he magically returned from practice two weeks ago where it's like oh my god it was it, it was last week um last so week. yeah it was the first time since i think september 4th we'd seen him so uh i don't know i, I don't think he's available i'm just saying like he returned a punt which was 
a good thing to see because this guy hasn't done anything from he hasn't even been at practice hardly for a month right now so yeah um, we'll see we'll see uh that will be maybe the big the biggest like i guess question then going in is just the depth at receiver and how they maneuver it because from a personnel standpoint because now you're 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 with Tez and, and Evan, and those are two really talented players, and Justice Lowe now becomes your third, and yep. he played the most and held up pretty well, I think, against Ohio State. Um, but then it's Jerry on Dickey, and who's the other guy? That's going to be the, maybe a big question for Jerry to track is who's, who are the other receivers in line now? Because we don't really know that answer. I, I think who travels would be interesting. Yes. Um, Brian mm-hmm. Pelham has entered um, games more than any of the true freshman receivers. It's been almost exclusively on special teams. Um, I would say he and Jeremiah McClellan would be the logical choices along with Jerry on Dickey to join the rotation. But I, we are yeah. looking at such small sample sizes and si- different situations that it's, it's kind of hard to tell right now. Um, I, I would, you know, again, we don't know what's going to happen with Trayshawn. He can just play the whole game and, and this is sure. a, kind of a moot point. SEC but, kind of punishment? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't anticipate that, frankly, but that's possible. And if that's the case, and this is, again, not a very big deal, but if, if he's not available for big parts of this game, it could be the main two guys, Justice, with a little bit of jury on, a little bit of Ryan Pelham, and and that's kind of the group. So, um, I mean, one, one last thought here just is that I, I thought Justice, we have a story up on the site, it's clear that Dan is really high on what he can be. He, you know, he said there's room for kind of a, a larger role or, a, 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 you know, a role that continues to grow for justice. And, um, you know, this is a guy that's a fun, this is kind of the cool stories of a season where this is a guy who probably entered in, as number six on the depth chart or on the pecking order, I should say, at receiver. And now he's in a spot where he played 44 snaps in the Ohio State game. And I think there's a chance he plays that or more um, against Purdue, depending on what's going on with Holden. And uh, we'll see as a pass catcher. But as a blocker, he's he's been great when he's been out there, and so that's something maybe you can you can lean on a little bit more going forward. Um, real quick, what other storylines for you guys to, to to see play out? Is there anything important before we go into picks? Yeah, I mean, I think just on Purdue, uh, there what what is this offense actually going to look like? Because it had been putrid all season. That made the change that Jared mentioned there, both in terms of play caller um, and quarterback. And it looked way better at the very end of that game. It was 27 to three at like halftime or early third quarter of that game. Like the yeah. offense didn't start playing well until kind of mid third quarter. But when it started playing well, and again, I think Jared brought up a good point. I thought the defenses in, for both these teams were terrible in rewatching the game. I, I went and yeah. rewatched the highlights a couple of times now. It was, it's been pretty, it's pretty terrible. I mean, like, well, we can get into it, but, um, but Purdue, when they did start hitting it, 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 I mean, they scored a ton of points in like about 25 minutes of game time to go from being down 27 to 3, 34 to 20, as, as Jared said, late in that game, to then being up 43 to 40 with like a minute to go in the game. And Illinois has mm-hmm. to rally all the way back, get the field goal, go to overtime, and then ultimately Purdue loses because it, it can't convert its two-point conversion attempt in, in overtime. Um, but they scored 49 points. So I am very curious, like, how much of that is real? How much of that is just a, a weird game where Illinois maybe kind of lost sight of things because they were up so much and and, and just kind of just kind of slept walk to the second half. Um, so that'll be what I'm curious on in terms of what like looked kind of good when I watched Illinois or sorry Purdue's offense. Ryan Brown's a really good athlete. Like this might be the most explosive runner with the football Oregon has seen at this position all season. I think Childs doesn't use his legs as much, but certainly has that same kind of um, skill set, but they use Brown's legs a lot. He ran for over hundred yards. Um, I think their tight end Max Claire is like really explosive, like kind of a weird, untraditional tight end. Like I think he's listed at like six, four two twenty five. but you know, when he catches the football and gets ahead of steam, he can really move. So that's an interesting player. And then I think both the running backs are, are pretty solid. So um, I don't think this is, I mean, this is an offense that scored 16 combined points against Wisconsin and Nebraska. So I don't want to build them up to be some sort of juggernaut, but you could see the path to them having some success based upon the skill talent they do have. And I, and I think frankly, like we'll see if it carries on, but it seems like they may have almost upgraded going from the veteran heart, you know, quarterback with card to the inexperienced guy with Brown. So that, that'll be kind of where my head's at watching this game, because frankly, I, Purdue's defense is terrible. I think this is the worst defense Oregon's faced probably all season. And I don't, so there shouldn't be a lot of resistance. Like, I think this is a game where Oregon could just consistently march up and down the field and finish drives with touchdowns. My question is, is how long does Purdue 
you know, kind of keep up? Can they, can they score a couple of touchdowns right. or can they, can they find ways to manufacture that offense and kind of keep it close early? Cause ultimately I, I think there's going to be quite a bit of separation in this game. I just don't know when it'll be. Yeah. My storyline is basically the same, just like what really is the Purdue offense? Um, one of the, and I can basically echo everything that Eric just said, but I'll, I will not, I will do something different. Um, cause I found the same problems or the same issues with both, you know, Illinois defense and Purdue's defense and their offense together. So it was, it was kind of a cluster that game was, but one of the things that really stood out when rewatching that game is, you know, Illinois defense is really slow and I don't want to get like into looking at what Illinois is in, in two weeks, but it was a slow defense and Purdue was able to capitalize on that with a lot of like end arounds, a lot of pitches, a lot of kind of trick plays where it's just getting mm -hmm. the whole defense in motion and trying to, you know, uh, just confuse them and get them to chase them. And it worked for the second half of the game. And I just think that Oregon's defense is significantly faster and significantly more disciplined than Illinois defense was. And that was kind of the thing was, Illinois defense against this new style offense, which, you know, I don't, it's tough for Illinois because that's a brand new offensive play caller who is a defensive minded head coach that you're not really sure what the <laughs> so heck is going on, and what they're going to play. So part of that is just the head coach is kind of like, all right, I'm just going to unload the clip here and just here, here's everything that's in my bag. And Illinois is like, this is the first time we're all seeing this. So good luck. But now that Oregon has some of that on tape, they're a better defense. They're a faster defense. They're a more disciplined defense. Like I think that Purdue could get like a like a score or two early and kind of be like, oh, Purdue Friday night. But I don't think that'll be sustainable as it was against Illinois. And if you're an Oregon fan, be prepared on a third down and medium for Ryan Brown to run for it and get it with his legs. That will happen plenty. That'll be like their best offense. I feel like at points for Purdue. Just understand that that is going to happen. So when it does happen, you do not need to scream at your television because I am telling you this right now <laughs> that Ryan Brown will use his legs to pick up third downs many times against Oregon, and it is okay because that's their best offense. All right, uh, that's going to do it for the first half of the show. Let's, let's take a break. When we come back, we will dive into our game picks. All right, welcome back to the Austin Audible's podcast. Uh, last week was a good week for all three of us. We all went seven and out of ten picks, uh, mm. different different ones. So the the standings doesn't change. Uh, Eric's still in first. Jared is in second, and I am in third. So uh, I guess I'll go first since I had the team props. Um, Eric had the offense; he'll go next, and then Jared had the defense. Um, Let's see here. Over under six offensive plays going 20 yards or more. I kind of looked this up. Uh, that was um, where they were kind of at uh, Purdue, uh, what they're averaging going into this one. It's just around what Oregon was averaging too. So I felt like the number was good. Uh, I said over. Yeah, I also went over. I think, the, I think Oregon has uh, 30 plays of this distance or more. So if you do the math, that's like five per game. Purdue, I said, as I said earlier, defensively is 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 really bad, and and we didn't even really get into it. But I'm just just a quick boiler maker breakdown on their defense. They've allowed 11 more points per game than any other Big Ten defense, and almost 100 more yards. So just to illustrate how what we're talking about, this is a they're averaging like 39 points a game allowed. So um, this is a very bad defense. I think six plays feels doable. I don't see any of this like on our prediction page. Do you guys have it loaded? It's all yeah, I just looked at it and it's all gone. I have no idea it's, what everything is gone. Eric, oh, are you I, seeing the same? I know I, I have seen the I, same thing. That's I, what threw me off I have here. it I all like, here, gosh. which is strange. Um yeah, I just have absolutely nothing. It's just the bare skeleton of what is going on. There's I'm gonna <laughs> what why don't I since <laughs> I see it, I'm gonna save it and maybe that'll fix it for you guys. Does that make sense? Sorry, yeah, to do this on the uh, sure. podcast yeah. live, but like we want to make good. sure that the story actually is still there. So I'm saving. Yeah, I, I, thought, I thought somebody maybe here. Somebody maybe accidentally saved it. Publish or, it. Uh, 
publish it like a current timeline. You're, you're, you're getting the full like peel back the onion discussion here. <laughs> okay, I just, yeah. I just, I just saved it that way. Do you guys, um, you guys, I is it there for you guys? Refresh. Give it a refresh. Hopefully, it is. A refresh. Uh, there we go. Uh, it's hold on. This is this is incredible podcast content, by the way. <laughs> so great. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's here now. Yay, we're here. Okay. okay. I'm happy that worked. All right. Um, Rain. Go ahead. Go, go oh, ahead, Jared. So I think it's me. Um, yeah, for the six offensive plays, I went over. Um, goodness gracious, this Purdue defense could be pretty bad. Um, and by pretty bad, it's like basically every game of the season except for the win against Indiana State. So – I think Oregon is well capable of doing this. They had, I think they had six of them going against 20 or more against Ohio State last week, if I remember correctly. So yeah. I think that they could probably do that against Purdue. So I went over. Next one, 297 and a half yards allowed over under by Oregon's defense. Um, I kind of went back and looked at just what this Purdue team is doing offensively, what Oregon's kind of averaging defensively as well and i i just picked a, a a a number a little bit below what they averaged this season they averaged 340 so i kind of picked about 40 yards less than than what they perform i picked under i think oregon's defense is gonna come up they're gonna play really well uh this is gonna be a a, a stout game for the ducks on, on defense this is kind of back to my point earlier about my storyline. Um, they just had 530 yards <laughs> against um, Illinois. Yeah. As Jared said, Illinois' defense is not is not great either. Um, but is that what this offense is, or is it the team that had 162 against Notre Dame, 319 against Oregon State, 224 against Nebraska, or 216 against Wisconsin? Um, I decided just to go with the over based upon the fact that their most recent game, they almost doubled that number. Um, I, I – Again, this is the part, probably the part of the game I'm just least confident in because Purdue's offense is the least predictable element, I think. Yeah, and for it being unpredictable, I went under. Um, at least I can predict what Oregon's defense can do. Um, sure. I think that it's going to be really hard for, for Brown to have his second career start against the Ducks and what they do on yeah. defense. Um, I, expect, I don't really expect Oregon to send too much pressure just because he is a running quarterback, so they'll probably want to spy or keep him in the cage, but – Still, Oregon's defensive front can get to him. Derek Harmon, Jamari, and the, the Tuioti and Uyungle on the edge. So I think that they'll go under. It's a really strange offensive team. But now that they have at least something on tape to go and watch, I think that'll help yeah. Oregon. And it won't be like kind of how Illinois was just reacting on the fly. All right, last one. Uh, over under Oregon rushing for a season high 241 yards on the ground. The current high is 240 against Oregon State. Purdue averages 225 on the ground. So this is another one where you look at it a little bit higher than than that. But uh, I'm going to take over. I think Oregon's going to run for a lot. It might be 300 yards, to be honest it, with you. 241 is a really large number, but this was like a no-brainer for me. Um, yeah. As you see, you've already run through. Purdue gives up a ton of yards per game on the ground. Oregon's rush offense is better than any rush offense that – they faced this season. And I think this game script could be a situation like if Oregon does pull away early, you could just see a ton of Noah Whittington, maybe Jaden Lamar, maybe Jay Harris gets involved in the second half where you're, you're, you're just kind of running the clock out. Um, so I, I think that number feels actually pretty attainable in this one. Yeah, I'll go over. Um, like you guys have said, this is the best rush offense that Purdue has faced all year. Um, and when teams like Notre Dame and Oregon State are both putting up over 300 yards on the ground, while I think Oregon will throw the ball a little bit more than those two schools respectively, uh, I think 240 could be easily attainable. And it could be just a lot of chunk plays early on. Yeah, it could be that too. That's a good point. Um, so over to the individual offensive props. I, I asked, uh, will an offensive, sorry, will an Oregon tight end score a touchdown? Uh, zero on the year so far, which was just a stat I wanted to make sure people were kind of aware of. They're uh, involving their tight ends more, but not in the end zone. So uh, I they're think trying. Really, they're trying. Uh, and and Ferg has dropped a few in the end zone range. Herbert had one that I think would have been almost impossible to catch against Ohio State. But like they mm -hmm. they they are trying. 
Um, I think this week they do it. So I said yes. Uh, I can't remember what I said. I'm sorry. Um, I said yes as well. I think it's just kind of finally time. Uh, it's just been – it's weird It's because uh, it's a it's an offense that features tight ends kind of heavily. Mm -hmm. They are kind of restricted this year where it's really just Terrence Ferguson as an option and then Kenyon Sadiq every once in a while, but he's more of like a decoy when he's on the field. So it's it's going to have to happen eventually. It might as well be this week against Purdue. I said no. I just think short yard situations, they struggle there. Um, they, they score touchdowns passing when it's deep shots or mid, you know, middle tier throws. So I said no. Okay, how about over under one and a half run plays of 30 yards or more? I uh, Auburn has five all year, which was – I shouldn't say surprising because I think there were zero the first like three weeks or something. Remember there was like a big, it took them until mm -hmm. maybe the Dylan Gabriel run in, in Corvallis to get one. And then they got a couple um, later on, but uh, I'm going over. I think Jared kind of nailed it with the chunk play thing. I, it, this could be a game where Oregon's offensive line, like cause Purdue's really not good up front or any level yeah. of its defense. I could just see a situation where Oregon's offensive line, not only wins, but wins to the point where the hole is so massive that Jordan James just cruises downfield and doesn't meet anybody until he's near the end zone. You know what I mean? So um, I, I think there's going to be some situations where something like that plays out where James might not even be touched for 20 yards before, you know what I mean? Before he, before he, uh, you know, is, is even close to making a tackle. So I'll, I'll take the over. Yeah. I, I went over here as well. Um, it's just a really good rushing attack against a Purdue defense that isn't that great. I was looking through like the average depth of, of uh, tackles for Purdue's mm. like linebackers and, and defensive linemen. It's like a, like three or four yards downfield, and that's not exactly what you want it to be. Um, obviously, like for safeties and cornerbacks, that makes sense because they're already back there. But uh, it's just not a great defense against the run. I imagine Purdue is going to try to stop that immediately. Like, again, if you control the run, you can control the game. But Oregon's offense is, is clicking. Their offensive line is clicking at the same time. Like, it's just going to be a tall ass for them. And I think James is significantly more explosive than, than guys that they've played this year. So give me the over. I also said over simply because Purdue's so terrible against the run that <laughs> I think it's going to happen. It might happen in the first half, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Last one that I have over under two and a half design Dylan Gabriel run plays. Uh, these are not scrambles. And I went under um, just because I don't think they want to use his legs unless it's a big game. This is as simple as it is. Now, I will say watching Purdue try to defend Luke Altmaier, who is not as explosive of a runner, but a pretty darn good one, yes. actually. Uh, yeah. He just ran. He ran wherever he yes. wanted to in that second half. So um, yeah. it could be there, and maybe this is the thing where they go. It's so there that we're just going to exploit it. Um, I also don't know if they'll be in a situation where they'll need to to pull out all the tricks. So I went under. Yeah, I would like clarification, clarification, please, uh, on the non-scramble quarterback design runs. What do we attribute an RPO to? That's that is a. I'm considering that a non-scramble. That, that okay. That, that that'll count. cool. All right, and I'm I'm still you know taking my under here because the RPOs I had to had to clarify because if it was RPO included, I feel like that's you know that's obviously how Dylan Gabriel scored against Ohio State. Like that's a, an option that could really work. It's an option that did really work for Illinois, like you were talking about with Luke Altmaier, who had all, all the world in the all the room in the world to run. Incredible. Good lord, it was incredible. Um, but I'm still going under on on Gabriel on two and a half. I think. You're right, Eric. I think they save his legs, and I don't think they put him in any danger. Yeah, if this was like one or two, like one and a half, I would say yes. I think he's going to be right at two. Um, to your guys' point, there's no really need for him to do this. So we'll see very minimal unless the situation arises where it's like you're just giving up touchdowns by not calling it. And that – could be the case, yeah. but I don't think they'll go in wanting to do that. So I said under. All right. Defensive individual prop bets. Um, you're going to start it off easy, just over under one and a half sacks for Mateo Iangolai. Uh, I went over. I think Mateo, upon rewatch of the Oregon-Ohio State game, was really, really good. Um, I thought that he was able to apply pressure. It's just, you know, Oregon's defense was giving up the short routes to its uh, opposing wide receivers, and 
Will Howard was taking him. That's why his completion percentage was so high. But uh, this is not a great offensive line for Purdue. This is not a veteran quarterback who's under, who can kind of understand where pressure is coming from behind him or in front of him. So I think that there's a good chance that Mateo has a really good day. Uh, same with Tuyoti, but I went with Mateo because sacks are better. And I think Mateo is better at that. The, the other part with a young quarterback who, who does have some juice in his legs – uh, he hasn't faced edge athletes like Oregon's, and I wonder if there's a little bit of overconfidence of like, oh, I can get out of this, and then there's Mateo for the sack, or there's Devin Jackson coming down to help. You know what I mean? That kind of a thing. Um, because he was great running the ball last game. I just think there might be more issues when things break down. So I also went with the over of one and a half for Mateo. I went the other direction. I said under. Um Partly because of what you just said, Eric. I think he's going to be the cause of multiple sacks. I just don't think he's going to be the guy that finishes them because uh, a quarterback evades Mateo and steps right into a Derek Harmon or a Jamari Caldwell or uh, maybe a Tatum Tuioti coming off the other edge. I think he will cause a lot, but I don't think he's going to get one and a half. That's a lot. All right, moving on, over under six and a half tackles for Taishim Johnson. Uh, Taishim and Kobe Savage led the team last week with eight tackles. I had the line set at six and a half. I'm going to go with the over here. Um, I think that Taishim's just kind of rolling in and playing in his best ball recently. Um, he's been good at the defensive point of attack. He's been good at pass coverage. He's been right there when a receiver makes a catch to tackle him. Um, I think he's one of the more surefire tacklers on the team. I think there's just going to be opportunities along the perimeter. Maybe it is a quarterback scramble where Brown gets out of pocket and then Taishim is there. Maybe it's just a quick hitting pass or it's a deep pass, whatever the case is. I think that he'll just be around the ball. So give me over six and a half tackles. Um, One thing to note here is Purdue's offense, I believe, targets the tight end more than any pass offense in the country. Mm Taishim theoretically could be in that matchup or involved there quite a bit. Um, so that's an angle for the over to hit. I went under ultimately just because I think that's a seven's a decent, it's a good amount. And I also think it's possible and almost likely that he's maybe not even on the field quite long enough to, to get to that number. But, um, you know, I, I will say, I think the, he's going to be to Jared's point in the area, a decent amount. It just depends on how far into the game he plays and, and how, and how many of the plays he ultimately ends up making, I guess. I chose the under, um, I just think that this is going to be a game where it's there really isn't going to be one player who stands above the rest. They're all going to have that three to five tackle number um, in part because of scheme in part because of score and, and time and who's playing what, but I just, as with him, there isn't going to be one guy that has just a, a large number of tackles. So uh, I'm saying under. All right, lastly, over under a half interception for Brandon Johnson. Uh, Eric just mentioned it. Huh? This this felt specific. Yeah, this is very specific. Eric just mentioned it. Uh, Purdue targets the tight end as much as anybody in the country. Uh, This is probably going to be Brandon Johnson's assignment. Uh, If you go back last year and look at Oregon's matchup against Texas Tech, Tashim Johnson was on the call against their six foot nine tight end whose name I. (laughs) do not remember anymore. Um, but that was his job. And Tyson Johnson played nickel last year. So in Oregon's defense, as long as Brandon Johnson is on the field, theoretically, he will be covering a uh, produced tight end. And so I'm just going to guess that he jumps in front of a pass one time or knocks it up and uh, gets a pass to fall into his hands somehow. So I'm going over here. Yeah, I think the thing with Brown, the uh, the new pretty quarterback, I, I don't know about tight window throws, and um, that could be an area where maybe his accuracy is tested here. And, and I, I agree on on Johnson with the Claire matchup. I also like last week Ohio State seemed to target him a lot, and I don't know if Purdue will watch that and say, "Hey, there's something there or not." But it's also possible they go, hey, "Well, Ohio State targeted him 11 times or whatever it was." we're going to find ways to try to go after him a little bit. And if that's the case, I think Brandon is, we've already seen him make an awesome interception in his first game as a duck. I, I think he's perfectly capable of making another impact play here. Um, I guess a Purdue quarterback who again is, is, is a real wild card here. And I could see maybe struggling or, or trying to do too much at times. This is one where like, if I had to pick one, I was least confident in my selection. This is it. Um, I'm going under, uh, I don't think he he gets an interception. 
Um, but like you guys have said, like he's going to be a focal point in the passing attack. That's kind of what Purdue wants to do. Um, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for it. Uh, but I just said under just – it's hard to predict one guy getting in a specific guy getting an interception. So I'm going under, but I don't feel a lot of confidence in it. All right. Uh, game predictions here. I guess I'll go first. Um, I, I was a little surprised. I have the, like the lowest score prediction of the three of us. Um, yeah. Oregon 38 produced seven. I just think this is a game where Oregon's going to get up by three scores and then kind of just milk the clock and get out of, get out of town. Um, it's a game you don't want any injuries. You want to get back from the travel perspective, um, kind of use that extra day if you can get it. So I, I just think like, Oregon's better in everywhere, every department. And I think there will be a little bit of a hangover effect from, from Saturday's win. It'll probably just be the first quarter, and it might be a case where Oregon's leading 7 to nothing or 10 to 10 to nothing or something of that nature. But um, that second half, it'll go quick. Um, and I just think Oregon's going to win this game behind a dominant run game and a defense that just gives up one score, 38 to seven. I, I mentioned it, I think on Monday, but this game feels strangely similar to Arizona state last year for me, where that was coming off of not the Washington game, but it was later in the season. It was after the USC game, but right before the Oregon state game. So kind of, again, a road trap game. Everybody knew Arizona state was bad. Just like everybody knows Purdue's not very good. Um, but we kind of were like, well, maybe this could get kind of weird. There's there's some strange connections here. Obviously, those connections aren't as aren't really prevalent at all in this one. But like, there was kind of just a sense that maybe it was a trap game, and and ultimately Oregon just came out. And the most important part was that Arizona State wasn't good enough to play with Oregon. And I just kind of feel like that's what we're going to come away thinking about Purdue. And so I I think this could get kind of ugly early. Um, and I actually just in kind of uh, I guess to appreciate last year's win over Arizona State. I, I went with the same score. So I went Oregon 49, Purdue 13. Um, that's a huge margin. That's a lot of points to score. 49 points against a Purdue defense is, to me, not a tall task to ask at all. Um, if Oregon is dialed in, I think they could score touchdowns on like six or seven drives to start the game. You know what I mean? Like they could just come out yeah. firing. So um, I think that's the case. And, and again, I'm giving Purdue 13 points. Uh, they may score way less than that. I, I I don't have a great feel for what they're going to be. I think Brown's legs could be the difference of a point, uh, you know, a touchdown here, a touchdown there, as Jared uh, suggested earlier. So, I, you know, but I, I, I think Oregon is so much better than Purdue. And I think they're going to come out and, and play really, really well. And if they don't come out and the score is, you know, 31 to seven or 24 to seven or something, it's going to be because Oregon is, is, is kind of stepping all over itself as opposed to something Purdue does defensively. Yeah. I've got Oregon winning 45, 17. Um, like we talked about much earlier in the show, this is like the definition of a trap game where it's, you know, short week, um, huge win, very similar to 2021 when Oregon went and played Stanford after beating Ohio state on the road. So I, I just don't think that this is going to be anything like that, um, mostly given how poor Purdue's defense is uh, against Power 5 opponents this year, Power 4 opponents this year, excuse me. Uh, Purdue's allowing 517 yards per game against Power 4 opponents. So that's five of their six games. So that's pretty pretty not great. Um, and I just think that Oregon's gonna just going to run the score up. And even if they throw in their backups, which I think eventually will happen, most likely in like the, the end of the third quarter or the beginning of the fourth quarter, um, there's no reason why those backups shouldn't put up points either. So I have Purdue scoring 17 points. I thought about going 14, but I don't know, 17 was just calling for me. And I just, I just don't know what to predict there. I don't think that that's a good enough offense based off of one performance against a moderately okay defense in Illinois for them to score like 24 or more points against this Oregon defense. I think they will score some points because there's still just a whole bunch of the playbook that nobody on earth has seen other than the people who are in the Purdue football program. Um, so maybe they can get Oregon on a trick play or two, but I don't think they're going to get it like a sustained drive. I don't think they're going to go, you know, eight for 75 and three minutes and 30 seconds, like multiple times throughout the game. I just think it's going to be, you know, a lapse in defense kind of similar to how Idaho scored their points where it's like, oh, my God, here's a giant trick play and it worked. Okay. Holy cow. So 
I got 17 points. I got Oregon covering the 27 and a half point spread, 45 17. Uh, I think that it could be, like Eric mentioned, it could be an absolute beatdown where Oregon just scores on their first seven drives of the game. There's just no hesitation. They just dominate from start to finish. And that's kind of what I'm leaning towards with this prediction. Um, but we'll see. We'll see on Friday. Real quick, what's the confidence level here? Uh, Oregon holds Purdue to zero points or Purdue scores four touchdowns? Whoa. Um, what, are you, what are we asking? Like, which like, is more likely? likely? Yeah. Which is more likely? Uh, probably shut out to me. 28 is a lot for this Purdue offense. Even, But, I mean, I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I probably lean I don't shut out. But it's that's actually a really tough one, Matt, because, like, I – their offense is the part I just don't really know what's going to show up. I I don't know either. I think I'd lean more of the 28 where they're just putting up 10 points against Oregon's backups like Michigan State yeah. did. And it's really not a close game for 95% of it. And then all of a sudden they're scoring, you know, 10 points at the very end of the day. I think I'd be a little more surprised if they scored 28 against Purdue or against Oregon's defense, first and second string. I just don't think they have a lot of talent and Oregon is going to be significantly better. But, all right, uh, that's going to do it for us here on the Austin Audible's podcast. Next time you hear from us, it'll be Jared from the stadium and Eric and I back home. Enjoy the trip, Jared. Safe travels. Until then, you're listening to the Austin Audible's podcast. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.